you so much, Madeline. Um, like Madeline said, I'm Jenna. I work for PICSO. I want to welcome everyone and say a great big thank you to the Champaign Public Library for inviting PICSO here today. Um, today, we're going to share our expertise about website design and development. Um, we're glad that you're here, and hopefully you walk away from our panel today with some helpful tips to improve your website's content, performance, and design. Um, if you're not already familiar with PICSO, we are a local web and software consultancy. Uh, we are located in Urbana. Our HQ is on Main Street in downtown Urbana, although I believe all of us are zooming in from our homes today out of a, an abundance of precaution and it's cold outside. <laughs> um, we create custom websites. We do software, uh, custom applications that address unique challenges for all sorts of different organizations. Um, across industries, everything from higher education to manufacturing and startup. Um, today, we're going to be talking about websites specifically. We have our crack expert web team here today. Um, like I said, my name is Jenna. I'm on the account team. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to really grill my colleagues today uh, with this Q&A panel. Um, chances are some of the questions and answers that happen to come up today will spark some questions among you. So please feel free to add those to the chat. Um, Madeline so graciously volunteered to monitor the chat for us today. Um, so she's gonna keep an eye on that. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, we'd love to know who you are, uh, where you're coming from. You can pop that info into the chat right now. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're lucky to have three experts in uh, the website field with us today. We have Tyler Edwards, Lindsay Markle, and Jason Rambeck. These three all frequently collaborate on website projects and each have very specific roles on the team. Um, I'm gonna give Jason, Lindsay, and Tyler a chance now to introduce themselves to you and tell you a little bit about what they do at Pixo. So who wants to go first? Raise your hand quickly. I'll go first. Hey, Ray. Yes, Jason's gonna go hey. first. Take <laughs> it away. Yes, my name is Jason Rambeck. I am a senior consultant and a developer here at Pixo and do a lot of the work or do a lot of work on website um, projects um, and write code, put the nuts and bolts and things together. Uh, so that's me, um, Lindsay. Hello, my name is Lindsay Markle. I am senior content strategist at Pixo. I've been at Pixo for over seven years, coming up on eight. Um, and I am, so I'm on most website. I do pretty much exclusively website projects. It picks up a lot of higher ed website projects. Um, and I'm on those projects pretty much from beginning to end. And we'll be talking a lot about that today, I imagine. So, uh, Tyler Edwards. Mm -hmm. I'm Tyler Edwards. I'm the senior uh, designer at Pixo. I've been here for, for eight years as well. Um, also, like Lindsay and Jay Ray, I'm, I work uh, primarily on, on websites, uh, but I, I do the, the work of defining how the website is going to look, um, uh, what the specifications are for um, interacting with the website, uh, and, and creating a, a system of, of visual guidelines for um, how the person interacts with it. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you to you three for volunteering your time today. Um, they present webinars all the time, so this is old hat for them. They are ready and willing to answer a few questions that uh, I'm going to ask them today. So I am going to put a link in the chat, or Madeline might uh, put it in the chat for me, to a little poll. Um, I kind of want to know what everybody's hoping to learn today, um, everyone meaning the participants who are attending today. Um, and you can answer however you like. Um, it's just an open field. And the question is, what do you want to learn today? I'm going to share the slide and I'm going to link to Madeline. If you just click that link in the chat, you can participate in this poll. And I'm going to share my screen so that we can see everybody's answers. And hopefully we get a few people with some great information about what they are hoping to learn today. A few more minutes, seconds left here if you wanna pop it into the chat. If the link isn't working for you, we can see things in the chat as well. Maybe we need to warm up a little bit. Okay, participants are typing, that's great news. Okay. 
Okay, well, let's see. Hopefully this populated. Sorry, I'm just gonna see if this actually brought in any results. I'm not sure if it's not working or if we're just not seeing any of the results coming through, but maybe you can share those in the chat. Sorry, I was hoping to do something fancy schmancy there and it just didn't pan out. But um, hopefully we can address some of the things that you did type into the word cloud if any of them came through. I apologize, it didn't work. Um, I blame AHA slides. Nothing I did, right? <laughs> Me too. There we go. Oh, there we go. Lindsay wants to know some quick content fixes. Well, that is something that we're definitely going to talk about today. Um, how can I get people to find my website? Another really great question. Um, these are all things that are right in our wheelhouse and we'll definitely be answering questions like that today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Lindsay, I'm gonna ask you a question. Lindsay is our content strategist. So those couple of early questions that we got about content and how do I get people to find my website? are in her wheelhouse. Um, what's your advice, Lindsay, to someone who maybe doesn't know where to begin? Um, maybe they also have limited resources or feeling stuck um, within, within where, they're, where they're sitting right now. What would you say to them? Mm -hmm. I would say, wow, great question, um, first of all. So I am a content strategist, like Jonah said. So my main goal is to work with people to figure out what stuff goes on your website, stuff meaning what kind of text, what kind of images, any kind of media, that sort of thing. And also how do you organize your website so people can find the things that they're looking for. Um, and one of the reasons that I really like content strategy and I feel like it's a worthwhile field is because it's so scalable. So if you, um, you can do an entire redesign of your website and overhaul everything and rewrite everything you have, that is that involves content strategy, but also um, just doing a quick check of you know one section, one page of your website, and updating something that has been out of date um, is also content strategy. So <clears throat> there's a lot of scalability there, and content strategy is also also has a lot to do with priority. So I would say for someone who's feeling stuck and not sure where to start, um, I think we'll be talking in more detail about these concepts today, but in general, think about your goals, your organization's goals, um, or your personal goals, whoever is creating the website. And then also think deeply about your audience, who you're trying to reach, and really, really, really think about what kind of questions those people come to your website trying to find answers for, and prioritize that kind of information first. Make sure it's um, just clearly written, make sure it's up to date, um, and, as far as that kind of stuff goes, just improving your content, um, no step is too small. I'm not sure that's true, but <laughs> no step. I encourage you to take the smallest steps that you can if you're really feeling overwhelmed um, because any improvement is an improvement. Yes, yeah, starting small is better than not starting at all, as we say. Um, scalability okay. is the name of the game. Yes, I rhymed. Thank you, Tyler, for being impressed. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, so we, we do... Um, you know, offer content strategy audits. If you're in a spot where you are not sure where to start with your website, we can come in and take a crack at it and bust things open and um, see it in a, in a way that you may not see it. Um, I'm gonna ask a question of everyone today, uh, all of the panelists. So feel free to jump in if something strikes you first. Um, what's the most important thing to consider in your opinion? when thinking about improving your website. And you might be biased with your responses since you each have different roles on the website team. So feel free to hop in. I bet in. we're not. I bet we <laughs> all have the same answer. Yeah. <laughs> One, I two, mean, three, just I'll, kidding. Yeah, I'll jump in and say it's something that uh, we just often say around here, which is um, this website isn't usually for you. <laughs> And so when you think about your website and what you want to put on the website, what kind of co you know, content, um, there's a big the, the common phrase, content is king when it comes to a lot of di different things, but websites uh, in particular um, of all the different things, you know, that are on your website, how it looks, how it feels, even that kind of stuff. You know, the content is almost always what people want from your website. They want to they want to get content. So um, making sure that you think about the website in a way that you realize that 
it's not for you and the things that you, the content that you put on the website or even the, the way that it feels potentially is about um, uh, your audiences, which you really need to figure out and define. So a uh, big, big thing that I think about is in all the different phases of a project, but um, I'm often involved, um, I'm, I'm usually involved all the way through, but very heavily at the end, so we're actually building these, the thing out and putting all the nuts and bolts together. And at the end, you know, I often tell people, all right, put yourself in your audience's shoes and use the website how you, you know, want them to use it or, or how you think that they, you know, to get to the content that they want or get to the thing that they need to get to or do the thing they want to do um, and do that. So that's kind of the, what I always think of when it comes to kind of the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in behind you there, Jason. So, uh, you know, what, what Jason's also getting at, and, and I think what Lindsay's kind of saying that we're all going to say roughly the same thing is that we put people first. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's the best way to improve your site is that, yeah, the website is not primarily for you. It, it's for others and how it's going to benefit others. And so when we think critically about the impact that it will have others, uh, have on others, then it's going to, uh, that's going to drastically change the way that we make the updates for our website to improve it. Um, and then from a design perspective, uh, one thing very specific, you know, to me is when, when we have an old website on a website that's been in existence for a while, uh, oftentimes things get added to that site, uh, over time, things that are maybe little patches here or there, or maybe little additions about, you know, the kind of information that you want to put out, uh, to people or little tools that might be helpful, but they get kind of put in and in, in random places because it's not all done at the same time. And so there's, you lose a lot of consistency. Uh, and so when it comes to improving your site from a design standpoint, is thinking really critically about uh, the inconsistencies that have been built up over time and how we can streamline uh, the, the visual experience uh, for our site visitors. Um, so, I mean, I just think of an example of, I'm probably going to talk about this again and again, but uh, say, for instance, um, you, you have a certain button style. Uh, that, that you use from the beginning. But then at some point you wanted to promote something really significant. And so you created a new button style for that. And then, and then you wanted to have something that was a little less detailed or less important. So you had a, a different button style for that. And over time you have five or six different button styles that all roughly do the same thing, but it can be terribly confusing for the people who are using your site. And so thinking really critically about how we can shore up those inconsistencies. Yeah, that totally yeah. happens with content too. The thing that Tyler's saying about it just things get pieced together over time. You can see, you know, like I said, we work a lot on higher ed websites, websites for colleges and universities, and you can just see sort of how things have happened over the years where some, you know, uh, uh, the dean or whoever was like, it's very important that we put this on the website. So it got like tacked on somewhere and then someone else wanted this. So it got tacked on, got tacked on. Um, and so, yeah, being able to look at it and realize that um, you are probably making this website so that other people can look at it and take some sort of action. Um, and so a lot of content that gets added on ends up being sort of a vanity project where if it's not meeting the goal, a goal of an organization, some objective for your organization, something you want to express, something you need to people to know, and a goal that you know an audience has, someone you want to be looking at your website, then it's probably not worth having on the website. Um, also, Jason was talking about the importance of, you know, putting yourself in your audience's shoes and thinking about them as you're trying, you know, if you've just added something to your website as you're testing it. Also, watch people use your website. Um, sit someone down who actually does need it and just creep over their shoulder and watch them use the website without leading them too much or, you know, and just see if it, see if it works for them. Um, that's another thing that's really highly scalable is usability testing. Um, and it could start with just observing one person and asking thoughtful questions as they use your site. Yeah, that's all roughly the same answer. Audience. Yeah, that's great. Content. Lindsay, yeah. I heard you, I've heard you use this metaphor before, and I always bring it up when talking about content for people who don't really know what we're talking about. When you move, you don't take all of your stuff with you to the new house. You take oh. your time to audit your stuff, pack the stuff in the boxes that belongs there that you're gonna use again. It's useful that other members of the family find useful, um, and then you go to the new house. But as you live in that house, you tack stuff on, you bring new stuff in, you buy new things, you stuff stuff in the basement, you never see it again. So I really like that metaphor when it, when it comes to like a content audit um, as you move to a new site or as you clean up your site. So great, I'll take credit for that one. Um, <laughs> Good thought, Jen, I love that metaphor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs>
So, um, Lindsay and Tyler, I want to ask you this question because we've kind of touched on the fact that our process looks different, um, maybe than some other organizations that folks may have worked with to uh, clean up their website or audit their website. Um, we really start from the beginning and we stay efficient along the way. Um, can you tell everyone here maybe what's the difference between what Pixo does and what maybe a marketing agency would do if they're cleaning up someone's website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, no hate to marketing agencies. I mean, sometimes we get we get clients at Pixo, you know, clients come to us, potential clients come to us, we're in the sales process. And sometimes it's such a relief, honestly, for me to be like, you don't need us, you need a marketing agency. And that's not what we do. Um, it is honestly a little confusing. And um, I think <clears throat> for me, the difference is for what I do in content strategy, um, I'm not doing something like necessarily writing taglines or thinking about detailed social media strategies like that is not my wheelhouse um our wheelhouse is a little more i guess nuts and bolts um i think this is something that we say often it's something that's in my head that um pixo is a really good place to come in particular if you're really not sure what you need um this can be a, sort of a red flag for me in in the sales process or the qualification process. Like if people come with a mock-up or with a wireframe and they're like, we need you to build this. Um, that's usually, we're usually not the best fit for that because our process is so focused on figuring out what the audiences need, figuring out what your important messages are, figuring out what the tone and the voice of your website should be. Um, and so we sort of, I don't have a metaphor for this and my brain is too cloudy to think of a good one, but it's like we give you um, ingredients maybe for something. <laughs> we, we, we like surface um, some things about you that will, be, that will be useful. And honestly, we do usually also write, you know, what, will, what your homepage will say and things like that. But as far as, you know, something like I said, like a, like a social media strategy, um, that's just not what we do. Um, so we're really focused on uncovering what you might not know about yourselves, which is really exciting. Um, people often compare it to therapy, I hope in a good way, because it just sorts of, it sort of tends to um, uncover uh, discrepancies and in, in what people thought internally at the organization about who the website's for, what's important on the website, what's high priority. So we come in as sort of mediators for, and investigators maybe for, for that sort of thing. I'm curious if that made any sort of sense, but That's Tyler, and I, was, I was thinking oh, about the good. therapy metaphors you were talking. So go for it, Tyler. Anything else to add? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I wouldn't say that the difference is black and white. Um, it's more of a spectrum. You know, there are plenty of things that we do that are akin to what more a, a marketing agency would do. And there's things that marketing agencies do that we do. But when I think about, especially from the perspective of a designer, uh, when we are working on design, it's, it's less about, you know, being seen and it's more about engagement. Uh, and so we want to create something, uh, especially from a designer's standpoint or from the design of the, the website um, that is going to be engaged in such a way that you can accomplish a task uh, that can communicate something really important. Um, and, and marketing does that, to be sure. Uh, but we think really critically about how people are going to enter into it rather than what they're going to see. Uh, and so one thing that I think of really practically uh, when it comes to the design process uh, that's the difference between someone, uh, you know, a group that's a bit more marketing heavy and uh, Pixo that, that's a bit more nuts and bolts is um, with marketing, it's it's easy sometimes to have a design process where you create, you know, three or four different just general directions for the design. Maybe you design like three or four different home pages or different brand and identity guide, uh, you know, logos or whatever it might be. Um, <clears throat> and you allow the, the client to kind of choose from that. Like, yeah, this one's kind of close. And then you kind of refine it from there. And that's, that's a fine process. For us, um, we, we collaborate every step of the way. And we're big believers in uh, Brad Frost's idea of atomic design, where we make uh, small decisions that build upon other small decisions. And so we're collaborating from the very beginning on what the, the core you know, kind of styles are going to be for the website. We make sure we have yeses on all of those. And then when we move to that next uh, step, we're gonna start to add those styles to content. And we're gonna collaborate on that between uh, Pixo and the client. And then we start to build out components and pages and different things. So instead of having uh, kind of a buckshot of different design styles to choose from, 
we're making uh, affirmative yeses along the way so that when we finally do arrive at a homepage, we are all confident that it was the right direction from the beginning. So that's that's another good example of our, of the difference. That's great. Yeah, I'm learning things too. This is wonderful. <laughs> um, I feel Jason, like maybe <laughs> I've, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, no, go for okay. it, Lindsay. Just Miley Cyrus saying right into the middle of your, well, I want to address Lindsay Growth as I'm giving us a gentle nudge. I feel like I just, <laughs> I feel like it would be useful to say a little bit about the, the what we do to figure out what the audience's need, because it sort of sets the stage for a lot of what we're talking about. Thank you, Lindsay. It's weird that Lindsay doesn't know she's worked here for quite a while, but um, <laughs> so Lindsay, <laughs> um, so the things that we do to figure out what the audiences need, we mainly, we talk to them. <laughs> uh, we do interviews. So we do what is called a discovery process, um, discovery phase. Um, and it's very people-based, very human. So um, the heart of that is doing interviews. So those are structured, mostly structured conversations with stakeholders um, <clears throat> and with audience groups, people. So like I said, for higher ed sites, we do a lot of that kind of work. We're talking to current students, alumni, professors, staff, um, people who answer phones, people who answer student questions. Um, and when we're having those conversations, this feels important, we're not necessarily talking about the website, which might sound really weird. We're not mostly focused on the website. We're talking about the topic of the website in those interviews. And that's how you get the good stuff out that people might not know that audiences need to know or question, you know, questions that they might not know that people have. Um, so for, you know, it's just questions like for current students, you know, how did you even find out that you were interested in your major? Um, what appealed to you about it? Uh, you know, how were your like parents involved in this process? Um, where else did you apply, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just trying to unearth, um, unearth the questions, the thoughts, the impressions that people have about whatever the topic of the website is. Um, and then it's our job to, you know, connect that to how to how that gets expressed on the website. Um, and that's all about prioritization as well. Um, what are the questions that people have? So again, for higher ed sites, um, which might not be the best example, I need to think of another one, but for higher ed, it's like uh, admissions information, program information is always gonna be top dog. Like if you can't find, program information and how to apply on a college website. Why, what's the website for? What are we doing here? We're reading a Dean's letter. Um, so we do interviews. We look at, we look at the current website and see how much content's there and do a quick audit of, is it up to date? Does it read well? Is it easy to understand? Um, look at peer websites. What are other websites that are trying to serve similar purposes to the thing that we're, that we're looking at? Um, or it's just sort of like, a, what's the bird, a magpie? What's the, is a magpie the thing that like, you bring a bunch of stuff into the nest? Yep. Yeah, you just yep. we go or go out and we gather um, a bunch of insights from, from people who are, who are involved and then find the themes, find the themes in, in what we're hearing. Um, but mostly it's what questions are people asking? That's like a really easy way to think about it. Okay, thank you. Please continue. Thank you, Miley Cyrus. <laughs> I wish That's I knew wonderful. more about Miley and I can make a good great great input great input um I do want to ask a question kind of turn a corner here um uh, before I do I'm going to mention that we are going to have a Q&A at the end there is going to be time if you have questions that bubble up um I'm going to look through the chat but we've been having some Zoom decided to release a, a feature today that they didn't tell everyone about in webinars so um, if you have questions and you put in the chat and I didn't get to see them, hang on to those. We're going to ask them at the end and there will be an opportunity for you to unmute yourself or put those in the chat again and you'll be able to ask the panelists directly. So I'm going to say that before we turn a corner and move on to talk about website performance with Jason. Um, Jason, do you have any tips for website managers who want to test their site performance and by performance, when, when we say website performance, we're not only talking about how quickly the site content loads and renders in a web browser, but also how well it may respond to the user as it's interacting with it. And feel free to clarify my definition there, Jason, but that's something I've pulled together. Yes. So what do you think? That's a fair definition. So um, we're talking about how long does somebody have to wait till they can do or see what they want to see. And so, yes, yeah, so that could be an interaction. Somebody wants to click to start you know, typing into search, 
you know, so one of the reasons Google, Google has a very simple uh, search page. Google's the number top search engine. You know, in years past, it would be, you know, uh, Yahoo or Excite or I'm kind of dating myself here. Um, but we had, well, those, those, those pages before search was as good and awesome as it was, they were directories. So they had lots of other content on the site and Yahoo's kind of a content website uh, anyway. But, you know, Google focuses on search and they want search to be load real fast and you can do what you want to do right away and you just want to start typing what you want to search for. So, um, so, it, a, a, so search, first of all, I could just, I just want to say search, I'm sorry, not search, performance is very important to um, how people feel about your website uh, and especially when it comes to how, it use, how usable it is. And so some research was done a while back here that took five metrics of user experience and had people rank them. And um, let me pull up the list here because it would be helpful to just know. So out of the five design, basically how nice something looks um, was fifth, simplicity, how easy it is to understand the interface was fourth, responsiveness, how nicely it fits on all the different kinds of screens uh, was third, content architecture, how easy it is to find what you need uh, was second. And number one was performance, um, getting just, getting to see or do what you need to do quickly. And um, I, th I think um, another metric that helps sort of um, uh, call that out is that 74% of mobile web users will leave a site if it takes longer than five seconds uh, to load. That's, you know, obviously uh, a huge number. And so, you know, you want to get under that five seconds. And there's, there's a bunch of uh, details wrapped up in how to get a web page to load faster, or there's even other metrics besides, you know, what is what is fast, what is loading, what are we seeing, you know, is it loading to see the very first thing on the page or the whole thing or or whatnot. But there's a tool out there, and it is called um, Page Speed Insights. It's actually a, a tool. There's a simple web page that you can just simply put a link into. Uh, the tool here and and have it go and and check the performance of your page, see how long it takes to load in different sort of scenarios. It tests, it can test like simulate a mobile phone and mobile phones might not be as powerful as a laptop. Um, sometimes they have slower internet connections. So it sort of emulates that kind of stuff. And um, it gives you, the, it, the, the nice thing about it is it gives you just a score um, and then a bunch of other details. So you can just simply go put your site in there, look at the score, uh, green, uh, it, it's got a scale of zero to 100, and it's kind of like uh, academic grades here. 90% and up is green, it's like an A, and then between 50% and 90% is the yellow color, and that's kind of like, oh, it's okay, you're, you're acceptable, you're kind of borderline here, and then 50% is the red color. And you definitely want to work on improving your your website um, performance and speed um, after if you're in that kind of territory. Uh, so that's a nice tool to kind of just check things out, check your website, or check maybe even other people's websites to see you know how other people, um, up, other maybe competitors or whatever websites are performing. And again, it's just very important. Um, you know, I always tell people the way that you design your website because for a lot of people, website is people's first interaction with them or their organization or their business. And um, people actually get feelings about um, how, how much you care, just like who you are as a, you know, organization potentially based on, you know, do, is your, if your website's super slow and doesn't work or it's buggy or that kind of thing, you know, you can, you can sort of get that sense as a first impression uh, to these people about, you know, who you are. So, um, I think it's important. It's part of what I do. It makes uh, when we build websites and do the nuts and bolts, we work really hard to make sure that things load really fast and that people um, kind of don't have to even th they're not even really thinking that it's fast. They just people uh, unfortunately they they notice when it's slow, but maybe not when it's really really fast. So, um, but that's I guess the summary of you know how one way you can check your own website, um, and and it's actually part of the tool set that we use too when we're we're doing work. Awesome. That's really helpful to have a resource. I, I did share that link in the chat. If you wanted to go ahead and test your site, head over there and see how you're doing. Green is great. Yellow is decent. Red needs improvement. Um, so I'm going to ask everyone a question now. Again, feel free to pop in if you have an answer first. Um, so we all use websites, obviously. Uh, we use them to get here today to this online virtual experience. 
Um, so as an expert, this is a fun question. What are some things that you notice that annoy you when you use websites in your own life? And maybe you can think about this question attendees as well. What are some things that trip you up and annoy you um, when you're surfing the web, as they say? Yeah, I'd love to hear what other people think. <laughs> so I have some, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started because this happens almost every week to me. And technically it's not a website, it's an app. There's actually two apps. I go to Sam's Club and I go to Walmart, usually once a week or more sometimes. And um, and again, this is related. Again, it's not a website, but the idea of being able to get to what you want to get to quickly um, is kind of this concept. And so um, when I'm at Walmart, I want to open the app. Almost every time I want to do one of two things. I want to uh, ch check a price potentially. And that's actually not that common because a lot of times everything's got well-marked, you know, uh, price displayed somewhere. Uh, but the big thing I want to do is just pay using Walmart Pay. And it's got a little QR code um, scanner thing that uh, will scan the QR code at the checkout. And that's what I want to do. And uh, I, they've gotten better here recently. Um, but Walmart's trying to do everything. And I, there was a question here about how much content is too, too much content. And this can be this... This goes to, to apps, but also websites just have a lot of content. You know, how do you fit that in? And it, it can be a challenge. And for somebody, um, you know, like Walmart, who has so many functionalities, you can buy stuff on there to check out. You can, you know, pr check prices. You can, you know, there's probably a dozen other different features. Um, you know, how do you get the right information and under, you know, at the right time to the person opening the app? Um, and so um, they, they've since done better where they make that more of a prominent thing. I would guess potentially that that's what a lot of people use the app for on a more regular basis. Um, and so they make, they're make they making that more prominent now. Uh, the other thing too with Sam's Club is I use the checkout or the uh, the ability to scan and pay for your stuff right on the app. And, and every time I open the app, it takes, takes me to some page or it used to actually, they've also gotten better um, where they showed me, I don't know, my last purchases or something like that. And then I have to kind of close windows or close things and, and open them back up. So that's an example of something that I run into almost every week, it feels like. And I'm like, oh, you could do better. And I see that they are doing a little bit better, um, at least for, for my experience, which is that's how I use uh, those different products. So anyway, that's me. I think Madeline put in the classic example that bugs me, which is uh, like superfluous information before I can see the information that I came for. Mm -hmm. um, and so recipes, like why does this have every recipe that's on the internet, like starts with a long personal story about mm -hmm. where this came from and all the times you've eaten it in your life. And it's like, that is secondary to the primary information of the mm -hmm. recipe. Um, and so I, I just like really that that's that's a theme across the internet. And so I don't know, it's probably harsh to call it a vanity, which I did use that word earlier, I'm aware, but um, that's how it feels to a user who's just trying to find something. You know, it's like this is much less important to me than this. Um, website uh, recipe websites are really um, egregious. Um, and there's a lot of comments about menus too, like navigation, confusing menus, confusing navigation. That's definitely one of mine. Um, I mentioned earlier that when we when we start a project, we it's usually for our website redesign of some kind. And so we have the step where we start by inventorying all of the major, all of the like important pages and files on a website, which sometimes sometimes takes forever. And um, if we're looking at a website and doing that, it's probably good because they know they have issues, they know they have problems um, already. So no need to like, you know, really hate on them. But sometimes when I'm doing those inventories, I am just pulling my hair out where we'll go to a menu, click a link that is in a certain section of the site, and then you're taken to a completely different section of the site and that sub menu disappears. And it's like, where am I? Um, <clears throat> so careful consideration of menus and how the navigation is set up is really important. Yeah, I would say the, there's no such thing as too much content if that content is relevant and like useful for people and well organized. Yeah, and the the organization thing is the thing I'm going to speak to. Uh, so I'm uh, in agreement with with these two. Um, but yeah, when it, when design is not 
uh, creating the right kind of visual hierarchy as well uh, in, in tandem with that content. Uh, that drives me crazy. You know, when the first things are not first and the secondary things look like they're first, you know, when uh, mm -hmm. certain sections that are that are uh, hardly important or calls to action that are hardly important compared to what the main goal of a website is, have a lot more visual emphasis, that drives me crazy. Uh, it also drives me crazy when there isn't consistency in, you know, the layout itself. You know, when you have just kind of peppered things here and there of uh, a button over here in the middle of this uh, this message and, um, you know, the, just kind of randomness throughout a site because things have been kind of piecemealed together over time. Absolutely drives me crazy. The contact information and email Billy said, um, pop-up advertising, that's like a whole other, yeah, agree. Um, and then oftentimes the contact information and email are difficult to find. This is like a great example of, please, please, we're begging you. Um, and that calls to mind um, in uh, 2020, we all remember the year 2020, we were newly in lockdown and uh, I was ordering a lot of food and I wrote a blog post um, for Pixo out of sheer frustration, like actual personal frustration that so many restaurant websites, I had to read like their life story before I could figure out if I could order online from them and what were my options and what is the menu and are you open? Are you open? And that's not lockdown specific, like much like recipe recipe websites, like just get me to the recipe. It's like uh, for restaurants, businesses, things like that. Just tell me, please, my first, like, are you open? If you're not open, we can move on. We can all move on with our lives. Um, so really thinking about the critical information that probably, I, I mean, I assume that people they take it for granted, people who are making the website. It's like, you know, you're like, well, what's important to me as a restaurateur is, <laughs> you know, how I thought of this business and, you know, my family's influence on it mm -hmm. and whatever. And that's all very well and good. And once I can come to your restaurant and eat your food, I might care about that. But first, just think about the basic information that people are looking for. Don't take it for granted. Oh, thank yeah, you, that goes back to your website is not for you. It's for yeah. your audience. Always a good reminder. I'll say one more um, thing too. There's sure. a there's a book out there that I think most web designers are familiar with um, called Don't Make Me Think. And it's like 20 plus years old. It's just been around for forever. And, and But the concept is the same, right? Well, what you want to do is you want people to naturally get to where they want to go and they only have to think about it because you're leading them, you're guiding them, you're giving them the right bits of information and the right amount, right amounts so that they can, you know, but know what, you know, get to where they want to go and get to it easily without having to think too much about it. So. I like that. Don't make me think. <laughs> hate thinking. Um, I'm going to switch to a Q&A in about five minutes, but I want to get one more question in under the wire for Tyler. I want to ask you a question directly about design. Um, I, you know, speaking to people about their websites, they, they really want things to look pretty. They want things to look nice. Um, they want a nice home page. Um, they they want the colors to look, you know, enticing to their customers, uh, much like we like to see things in the real world. So, how would you respond to someone who would come to you as a as a UI designer and say, "I just want my site to be pretty"? Mm, great question. What would you do? Uh, so, so great question. Yeah, <laughs> um, it it's definitely a, a conversation where we change the mindset um, because. I agree. As the designer, I want the website to look great. Like that'll be that'll be a great plus when we when we finish it up. Um, but we're if we're only concerned about um, how the website the website looks, uh, then we're really going to miss out on on what it does for the people who are visiting it. So we we've been talking about this already. Um, but if we're not considering our site visitors first, the people first who are going to be most impacted by it, uh, and just more focused on making it look good then we're gonna frustrate a lot of people. We're gonna get some of these same things that everyone's talking about in the comments, uh, where we have superfluous design. I said that wrong. Um, <laughs> design that you know is more for for, um, for show than it is for, for actual engagement. Um, and so uh, really doing the hard work of, of you know, figuring out our users' needs uh, and, and constructing a, a, you know, a website, a homepage or whatever it might be uh, to, to fit those needs. Uh, and then when it comes to the actual design, we also need it to, um, we need it to be right when it comes to expressing who you are as an organization. You know, what's your brand and identity? 
uh, and how does that play out on the website? So Jason was talking about this a moment ago, how um, a lot of people's uh, first introduction to your organization is going to be through your website. And so how do we most effectively capture the character and identity of your organization on the website through design? Are we, you know, are we just going to go bold and brash because it's a website and we want to make it look pretty or are we going to do it effectively? And so, I know from our perspective at Pixo, we, we really become students of your brand and identity guidelines. Uh, we really learn everything that there is to know about who you are and how that can be expressed visually. Uh, and then you know, that paired with, you know, learning all that we can about the, the user's needs and what the goals of the website are, um, we, we weave those things together. And so, yeah, we're going to make it pretty, uh, but that, that pretty is going to be um, impactful as well and engaging as well. More than pretty. Yes, I believe we also have a blog post. Um, we can share all these links also, Madeline, mm -hmm. I, I hope I can send this stuff to you and you can get it out to folks as a resource after the webinar ends. Um, and she so smartly put a link to that book that Jay Ray mentioned. It's available at our public that? library, believe it oh. or not. How convenient. Um, so yes, yes. Yeah, so she's, we're gonna share the recording, <laughs> any resources, links uh, shared in the chat today. We'll pull all this information together for everyone so that you can have it as a resource. Um, and our door is always open, info at pixotech.com if you have additional questions. Um, if you have questions now, feel free to pop them into the chat. I'm going to pull up some questions that appeared a little earlier. Um, maybe we can revisit those earlier questions. Um, one of them was, do you use offline mockups for testing organization categories, button language? Um, how do we test things along the way as we're developing a site? Mm -hmm. Great question. I'll, I'll speak to that because we're talking about mockups. I believe, was that Evelyn who asked that question? Uh, that one's been on my mind. I saw it earlier. Um, so, yeah, so it, when it comes to, um, you say, offline mockups, we, we aren't designing on the web. And I know that's uh, becoming more of a popular thing that we're kind of skipping design programs and creating actual mockups and just going straight to the web. But there's a lot of um, it's a lot of decisions that we really miss out on opportunity to do when it's in more of a malleable place like a design program. So at Pixo, we use Figma primarily uh, for our design program. And when it comes to actually creating designs, uh, Figma is incredibly useful when it comes to testing things because uh, there's, it has a really great prototyping aspect to it. And so we can actually create websites that look and feel like real websites without doing the hard work of actually creating them into the real websites that allow our, our clients and our, and our potential site visitors to interact with it in a way that gives us good feedback so that we can make those changes in a kind of low budget way there. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, we do use offline monitor. Does that help? Does that answer the question? I can speak a little bit to the um, navigation testing as well. We use, an, we use a tool and a third-party service called optimalworkshop.com. I will put it in the chat. Um, it, I believe it's 99. You can you can use it for free, but there's a limit on the number of participants you can include. But I think it's 99 bucks maybe for an unlimited number of testers. And using Optimal Workshop, um, you can test a na your navigation for your website, and that's what we do. So we uh, create, I won't go into all the nuts and bolts because Optimal Workshop does a great job of describing it on their site. Um, but basically, you can test your website, send it to test the navigation, send it out to audience groups um, to test, and then it's sort of um, 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 pulls together the results for you so you can see where people are getting tripped up, where they, um, you know, what just doesn't make sense to them. Um, we've also done completely, completely, what is the word for, on paper, not on the internet at all, made out of paper, analog, um, analog, <laughs> analog testing, <laughs> um, card sorts, um, I am not sure. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Madeline, too. <laughs> um, navigation tests in person. Um, we did some work years ago for um, circuit clerk's office and we went to the, the courthouse with a box of donuts and um, a little slip of paper that had every, the title of every page we knew was going to be on the website. And we said, hey, you want a donut? Hello, citizen of Champaign County. If you'd like a donut, you can come in here and um, just sort these these pages into groups that make sense to you. There are no rules, just right. <laughs> it's just for you. And um, people weirdly, maybe not weirdly, have fun doing that. People really like to participate in that. So mm -hmm. 
um, doing some testing in person like that is really fun too. Haven't done it in a while, maybe for obvious reasons, but when it works, it's great. Yeah, post-it notes. Um, mm -hmm, I would mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. a donut right now. So um, a, a couple of one. these other earlier questions, I'm happy to say, it seems like we've answered. Um, how do I know if my website is due for a refresh redesign? Um, earlier, we were talking about watching someone using your website. I think that might be a good indicator if it seems confusing to them. Um, also, the the metrics that Dayray pointed to in terms of performance. Anything else to add? How do I know my website is due for a refresh or redesign? Mm, good question. Uh, one thing to consider is accessibility. And I know that's something that uh, we're hearing a lot more of, which is really important, but uh, some older websites do not have not considered that as much because it's not been a part of the conversation as much as it should be in the past 10 years or so. Uh, so your website may have some certain violations on it that uh, are gonna make it for people with uh, different seeing impairments to, to engage with it in the right way. And so even that alone is worth considering there's some things we've got to fix here, uh, let alone having a new website. So things like that, as well as other uh, technical issues of, you know, does my website work well? Uh, respond with screen sizes, you know, whether a phone or, or a you know extra 4K website or uh, screen, whatever. Um, so yeah. Great. So auditing your content, auditing design, auditing for accessibility, auditing, audit, 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 performance, so many different things to check over your list. Yeah, people are complaining. I'm trying to think of reasons that people that people come to Pixo and say, like, we need a redesign. It's like, yeah, people are complaining that they can't find things. Um, Sometimes yeah, it's not tool, responsive. The, the content management system that runs it is just aging or it doesn't you can't do the things you need to do um, in that tool. Sometimes that's the, the, the reason and you can't upgrade it anymore. It's doesn't, it's more, it's more work to to kind of fix it and it and hobble along than to just kind of start from scratch. That's another reason. Yeah. Yeah. Lindsay, Lindsay Growth just said also really important. If you're not meeting your business goals, your website is a tool for your business. Um, I think people often underestimate how much of a tool the website can be for the business. Um, and so, yeah, just thinking of ways that your website can help boost you in areas where you're, where you feel like you might be flailing a little bit. I want to ask this other question that popped up way earlier. Um, how can I get people to find my website? I know this is really important for small businesses or people who are maybe just starting out. Um, how can people maybe organically find your website, um, what, what are some things you can do to make your website strong in terms of uh, being able to be found? Yeah, you know, I'll just start off with, so there's lots of different things that you can do. And, and uh, one of our strengths is um, this discovery process audiences, understanding what content to write and how, you know, what to say and, and how to lead people sort of that are actually users of your site. And so when it comes to that, obviously that's not, bringing people to your site, but when they get there, they can do what they want to do. And I think that's a really necessary and important foundation for one, what you want to do. Once people get there, you don't want them to kind of be frustrated. You want them to be able to do or, or lead them where you want them to go or do what they want to do. But one of the things we found that is really, really beneficial about that is um, search, search engines like Google um, are really, really good at understanding what is a good website for real people. And so content that is written well, that is organized as well, and that kind of thing, you will get benefits, lots of benefits from you know, organic searches uh, to your website. Now, it's not the end all be all, um, but it could, it's a, it's, 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 it does double duty, right? Because it, it help, it's actually very effective for when people get there, but it also is really effective for getting found naturally or organically. Um, in search engines. So I'll just throw that out there, but I don't know if anybody else has any sort of marketing tips for findability. No, I mean, no marketing tips. So just to expand on, on what Jason's saying, yeah, that's like a basic building block of, you know, SEO being found on the web. I always say to clients, your website is not the field of dreams. I have literally never seen field of dreams, but I know if you build it, they will come. That's not your website. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, once people get to your website, make it easy for them to find what they're looking for. We've been beating that drum this whole time, so I'll leave it alone. But um, as far as good SEO and Google responding 
to your page and, and um, you getting a better search ranking or people being able to understand what your website is when it shows up in Google results. Um, formatting on the page can be really important. Um, no big blocks of text that are just like unending paragraphs. Put more white space into your pages, I would say, than most people think they should. Um, white space, we love white space on the web. Um, and it's easier on our eyes to scan and quickly understand what a page is about and if we're in the right place. Um, clear language, ooh, I'll put my favorite <laughs> in the chat. I hope this is the right URL. I'll test it first, folks. Um, I love this tool for, for simplifying your language on the, web, on the web and making it more readable, HemingwayApp.com. Um, is a web editor, a text editor that's all online where you can you can type, you can edit, and it gives you a readability score and tips for making your text more readable. Um, 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 using words that you might take for granted. Like one time we did a sort of an audit of an existing website um, and people were worried that they just that their content was not being found the way that it should be. And once again, they were sort of taking things for granted, like, I don't remember what the example was, but, um, you know, it's a, it was for a certain product and they didn't use the, the word, you know, I don't know, like product on the page or something. It was like, you never actually use the word of what this thing is because in your mind, you're taking it for granted. Um, so someone searching for that word might not ever find what they're looking for. Um, yeah, those are just some really basic building blocks of, good SEO and being found on the web. Yeah, I always like to think of, you know, SEO is a product of a great site. The site has to come first, you know, it has to be like mm -hmm. organized well, things in all the places, using the right words. You know, if you're Kleenex.com and you never say tissue, there you go. Lynn. Thank you, yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna ask a question about um, everyone's favorite thing. Squarespace, Wix, um, these kind of small website generators um, that small businesses can use. Um, what do you say to DIYers about using these website generating platforms? What do you recommend in that process? Um, Weebly, Shopify, et cetera. Um, what do you think as experts? I, so I should say probably none of us here are, are experts in this specifically, but I have personal experience with Squarespace. We have a lot of clients who come to us who are using Wix or who have like a main site that we're redesigning. And they're like, oh, we also have a million side Wix sites that, you know, these other people started. Um, so I don't have any experience with them. But I guess what I really want to say is like, yes, go go forth, like Godspeed. Because um, a lot of times, obviously, cost is a, is a factor. And um, not everyone needs, not everyone can afford a completely custom, you know, website. Um, I have used Squarespace in the past. Like I said, I really like it. Um, and it's pretty, you know, to, to register a domain and to pay for a year of Squarespace, no matter what level you're at, is probably pretty cost effective for most folks, um, depending on what your needs are. And, and I, well, I guess what I want to say what's most important is these building blocks still apply. So things like Squarespace, mm -hmm. again, we can't say which one is best, but in my experience, it's like you still have to go back and think about who is my audience? What is my most important content? What words, when we're thinking about navigation and menus, what words do the people who you want to be using your website use when they're thinking about that content? Um, you know, not just, just not blocking people out with things that they don't understand, acronyms that they don't understand, making that language understandable. I would say, again, but I would say that probably any of those tools are pretty equal. Um, in terms of what they can give you, depending on your price point and how much time and money you want to put into it. Um, and definitely just focus on those building blocks, no matter what tool you use. If Squarespace were paying me, I would say, use Squarespace, it's the best. I have had good experiences with them. And they use a component-based, anyway, they kind, of, they kind of use a system that, that we also use for building pages, which is pretty modular and easy mm -hmm. to understand, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah the only Maybe thing that be. uh <laughs> uh a major difference too and yeah i agree with Lindsay. like by all means go for it i've done the same thing just for my own personal projects um it's easy for uh these you know these really simple website generators like squarespace and wix to uh to get something out there and do it right away and you have something that looks professional the only trouble is a lot of them just kind of look the same 
Uh, and so do what you can uh, within the, the system that they give you to make it unique, to make it kind of stand out as your very own. Uh, and I know Squarespace gives you a lot of uh, customization and ability to do that. And there's all kinds of things that you can do uh, just to even to the code itself to, to change it up, you know, just like a good old fashioned MySpace profile. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but just do what you can to, to really kind of set it apart from the others. Otherwise, by all means, go for it. Yeah, Lindsay yeah, Growth pointed out a... also, sorry, but, uh, no, that accessibility, it, accessibility yeah. can be a big problem on sort of pre-built sites like that. So make sure, you know, it's, you want your website to be equitable. You want everyone to be able to access the content the same way. Um, so accessibility considerations are also really important. Yeah, I was and just uh, going to say, you know, we're, we're a custom shop, Pixo is. So we really cater to our clients' very needs. Um, we use tools like WordPress, and then we use our expertise like content strategy, UX design, UI design, um, to really build a site that is functional for your audience specifically. So um, obviously, it's like a bigger task to take on. You're, you're hiring a team to build your website for you. Um, but sometimes, you know, you're a one-person staff, and you've got a, a business, you've got a photography business, and you need a Squarespace site. You need people to be able to purchase stuff, so. I think that it's it's definitely a tool that is inclusive and useful. Um, and we're hopeful that we can share some tidbits and takeaways for you um, to take on with you in your professional lives. I know that there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to, and that's a really great thing. A lot of you are engaged today. Um, hopefully you're learning a lot. Um, I did put our info at kind of our general email in the chat earlier, and you're welcome to email us additional questions um, as you have them after we close out today. Um, so yes, and, and as Madeline suggested in the chat, that's a great idea. We could answer other questions in the supplemental email um, if anything pops up. So um, we're going to share some resources with you that we shared in the chat in an email afterwards, as well as the recording. Um, so we'll, we'll try to tie up all the loose ends as we can um, in a follow-up email. Um, any parting words from any of the panelists or Madeline, or would you like to jump back in and close things out? Hello again. Um, I'll let the panelists take the to stage if they have anything else they want to say or share. And in so, thank you. Thanks, yeah. thanks everyone for being thank here. You, yeah, yeah for sure. so thank you so much. Yeah, we really yeah. appreciate your time. An incredible um, just panel. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you all and listening to the questions shared by our community members. I think for me, I loved um, just the I didn't know about visual hierarchy and learning about that a little bit more and how we can always, you know, keep our customers at the forefront of our website in consideration of how they use it, accessibility and creating our content. So a lot of really great gems today. A huge thank you to Lindsay, Jason and Tyler and Jenna for being an incredible host and I guess Huge thanks to Pixo for being so accommodating when they just get a random email from a librarian. Um, thanks for having us. Yeah, this is our first Campaign Public Library webinar. So we'd love to do more in the future too. If anybody has topics that they'd like to hear about, we're all ears. We will definitely take you up on that. And Sydney, yes, this webinar was recorded and I will be, um, so everyone who has registered, they will be receiving a copy of the webinar um, because we'll be uploading it to our YouTube channel for you to use. And then um, we are gonna be sending all of the resources shared throughout the chat and maybe some supplemental questions that we were not able to get to today. So um, if you have any additional questions, again, um, Jenna shared the info at Pixo dot com email um, that they are definitely very generous with just sharing that resource um, or you can always just email me at um, librarian at champagne.org so thank you all for sharing your lunchtime with us we really appreciate um, your time and have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope the staff at Pixo um, feel better <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> thanks everyone yeah, thanks. Thank everyone. you. Thank Bye. you. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye.